This podcast is part of the Shareable Podcast Network. Learn more at shareable.fm. This podcast is Shareable. I'm your host, Jeff Gibbard, commonly known as the world's most handsome strategist and professional speaker. I'm also a superhero. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single Shareable episode. And that's it. That's the intro. Short and sweet. Let's get to the show. Welcome back to Shareable. Today, my guest, Tony McClelland, is a critical friend and a business mentor. She's also the managing director of First Life Consultancy Group. Tony, welcome to the show. I'm pretty excited for what we're about to do. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited too. So tell people a little bit more about uh, your background, what you do, just so they it can help kind of contextualize the rest of the conversation we're going to have. Okay, so my background is predominantly in the social impact space. So um, criminal justice, education and care, generally I'm found championing disadvantaged groups. So it's generally people that have, um, you know, PTSD, mental health, special educational needs, you know, those types of um, people and organizations. So uh, that's where you'll typically find me. And so, um, yeah, so I would describe myself as a critical friend um, and a business mentor, but I come with fairy dust. I want to know more about fairy dust. I want to know more about critical friend. Which path do we start with? Let's start with critical friend, because that is a unique way of introducing and identifying yourself. You know, I introduce myself as a superhero. You introduce yourself as a critical friend. Tell me more about that and why you choose that as sort of the, the moniker to attach to yourself. Because it's what I am. And um, I know, but the thing about it is, Jeff, what's really, really interesting is that I know that I'm never going to come up in any search results based on that name because no one's going to search for critical friends. However, that doesn't bother me because it's the best descriptor for what I do. And, um, and I've been told that I do it reasonably well too. So so uh, there's, there's a little bit of refinement, but um, I, you know, the way that I work typically is I don't tell people what to do. I do lots of questioning and lots of prompting of thought so that I'm trying to guide you to make your own decisions rather than me telling you what you need to do all the time. So that's kind of how I, I guide you and, and, and give you some of the options and, and be a bit of a devil's advocate really and give a different perspective and help people to find their way. So that's kind of where that name has come from and it's stuck around for a long time. But it's particularly interesting because my background, I really do do lots of work around crisis navigation and generally unsticking things that are stuck, whether that's an organization or an individual. If someone's come to a path where it's like they don't know where to turn or they don't know what the next move is, I unstick. So I'm a critical friend in that capacity and it suits what I do really, really well. So um, in terms of what I do, I generally describe it as I put fires out in organizations that are on fire which is generally around culture and I start fires under people that are starting out in business with all of the learning that I've taken from one end I'm bringing it to the other so um I'm a fire putter outer not a firefighter and a fire starter for those people that need a little bit of um enthusiasm, shall I say, to get them going. So let's talk about the fires then. And I think this will lead us into an opportunity to talk about your fairy dust. Um, there are a lot of different types of fires that could happen inside of an organization where there's crisis planning required or uh, navigating through difficult situations. Then there's also, there are fires that are raging, like, oh my God, come in and fix this inferno. And then there's also sort of smoldering, uh, you know, a little bit of smoke. It's starting like if, if just enough kindling gets on it, pff, bonfire, right? So when it comes to culture, a lot of times, a lot of that, those fires are simmering um, and, and they're, you know, ready to potentially explode. Can you talk a little bit about what causes someone to pick up the phone and call and reach out to a critical friend like Tony? What are some of those situations that might occur? In generalities, you don't have to get into specifics, I know, because crisis work is one of those things where sometimes you don't want to, you know, you might not reveal the names to protect the innocent. Uh, but in general kind of terms, what are the sort of fires you're coming in to put out? Well, first of all, I would like to say that um, I kind of see myself as the fourth emergency service 
you know, so um, there are generally three and um, I'm the fourth one. So if you're in a situation where you don't know what to do or it's difficult to navigate, it's good from that perspective. But what I can say is that most of the fires in those in those organisations are around culture and culture leads us back to people. So everything is around people. It's not about the money, it's about the people. So technically that could be something major from, you know, we have a regulatory piece that we need to fix and we can't trade until we do this, this piece of our business. It could be some kind of inspection. It could be some kind of safeguarding piece that they need to keep people safe or a business continuity just to get to the next bit of their business. So it means that they're at a crisis point and they can't move forward. It could also be a, chain, a piece of change management that needs to happen in a very timely way. And we know what happens with change management. You have to go through all the different phases, consultation, et cetera, et cetera. But it could be something that needs to happen very quickly or something. It could be it could be, um, you know, that somebody is. Uh, yeah, yeah, it could be a variety of different things. Got it. And I know uh, it's going of, into a brain overload there. From yeah, yeah, because there's so many different crises that can come up. I know one of the things that in our previous conversation you brought up was dealing with the humans in business a lot. You know, you, you always come back to the people. And one of the things you talked about was diversity in the workforce. Now, I know that your primary work isn't in DEI, but I know it intersects with the work that you're doing in crisis management. Can you talk a little bit about how sometimes those two factors come together? You're dealing with crisis and you also have the, the issue of the diversity of your workforce. Okay, so, so basically you've got the, the care criminal justice education piece and not, not everyone recognizes the fact that DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion or equality runs, underpins all of it. Because whether it's in criminal justice, it's about disadvantage, it's about equality, it's about equity, different people needing different amounts of, of help. And, um, you know, you've got the diversity, you've got different things for different people. And I'm one of these champions that I believe that every single person is an individual. Everybody is different. And what happens is that we, we generally are categorized under a one umbrella unless we have an identified special educational needs. So for me, um, the DEI piece is really just looking at everybody as an individual. That's how sometimes you have to look at it. And rather than me going to individuals and saying, well, do you have something? You know, I would rather go to them and identify what that is rather than wait for them to come to me. So, you know, that's where the DEI piece, it runs across everything. And um, some, especially with what's been happening of late, you know, I've had to take that out as a separate piece, which I don't normally like to do because, you know, when you're working with organizations, you have to really show them that it underpins everything. So I like to do it in an underpinning way and it runs across everything. And quite often you'll see now, especially around people, it's sitting around people, culture, HR, but actually it runs across the whole organization. And it does come back to people because when it comes to business, if a business comes to me and says, Tony, you know, look at our strategies, look at our policies, can you adjust it? Where this is going wrong, we're losing money. For me, the policy is really about, and the strategy is really added value because the paper can say anything it wants to say, Jeff, you know? Mm -hmm. It can say absolutely anything, they're just words on the paper. And normally what I say is, let's not look at the paper, I need to see the people. Let me at the people. So I would want to go into the organization, sit maybe in the back of a team meeting or a leadership meeting and just observe. Have a couple of conversations with a couple of key people and just observe. Find out who the movers and shakers are because it generally isn't the person that's commissioned me, even though they think it is them. Because I'm going to find the movers and shakers that I need probably sitting in the back of the staff room. You know, so... So once I've gathered that and had those conversations, I'm probably 70 or 80 percent nearer to finding the answers. The answers are always in the people. Don't do, do, do you see where I'm going with that? Jeff? Oh, absolutely. In the work that I do in brand, um, so much of what we do before we even determine what is the positioning the company should have, how should they talk about themselves, their messaging, all these things. 
we have to talk to people inside the company and we have to talk to people outside of the company and we have to better understand what is true for them. Because again, similar to you're saying about you can write whatever you want on the paper, you can write a brand strategy, but if you're just coming up with it out of thin air from what you believe when maybe people inside who, who are part of the team experience it differently, that's, there's going to be a conflict there. And likewise, if you're dealing with people outside of the organization and you say our brand is X and they go, mm, it's kind of more like Y, now you have an incongruency between what you say you are and what people believe you are. So I'm a big fan in, in the work of brand of bringing all of those perspectives to the table and trying to figure out what is that point of overlap. And then that's kind of like, you know, again, using these, these examples of fire, like that's your, that's your spark, right? And you need to throw kindling and gasoline on that because that's the thing that we can all agree on. That's who we are. That's who they think we are. That's who the people inside think we are. And that's who we think we are. Great. Now let's work on that. And if we have this other aspirational identity of who we want to be, then we can move from this point of agreement from there. So I think what you're saying makes perfect sense about really talking to the people. And I, and I also really appreciate your framing of DEI work as being sort of an, a foundational underpinning, mm -hmm. um, because I think all of the people that I know that work in DEI believe that. And I think that they are working towards getting it to be that. I appreciate that you are, it sounds like you're sort of starting with the assumption that it kind of already is, and you're going to operate as if it is, and that breaking it out as a separate thing is like something you don't really want to do. Well, no, I don't want to do that because actually it's such a fundamental piece of my work. It's embedded. It's embedded as a core value, but people don't recognize it. You know, how can I be in specialist education? I, I've managed, um, you know, specialist education provisions. How can I do that if I didn't have DEI at the center of it and, and individualized learning and all of these things? And how can I manage care settings or children's homes without having that understanding of all of the work we have to do for the young people and the work that we have to do for the staff to be able to do that? So, so you do it, it's almost like, it's almost like breathing and blinking. You just do it without thinking about it. And now I've actually got to extract it from my work and set it up as a separate, a separate offer, which doesn't feel very comfortable, but it's like, here it is, you know, here yeah. it is. Because the fact is I'm not a newcomer. I mean, I've been around, I've been around 30 or 30 odd years and um, I know I look 21. I know that's, I, I know that's what you were going to say. I was literally just about to say that. Yeah. Oh, you're so kind. I'll go easy on you later. Nice. <laughs> so, so I know that, um, yeah, I've been around for 30 odd years and there was a big case like the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. There, there was a murder here um, many years ago in the UK. I'm not sure if you would have heard about it in the States, but um, you know, there was a big inquiry on the back of that that actually said that there was some institutional racism and there was, you know, some of it was fundamental within the police service, the Metropolitan Police Service, which is the London, the London Police Service. And I was part of the team that was delivering training, diversity training to that team. Now, all of a sudden this year and a little bit of last year, it feels like DEI has just kind of come into fashion. You know, the, the acronym of the month. And it's, it's almost a bit like, you know, and, and, you know, I think it's great that there's so many people interested in doing it, but I'm just trying to explain that there are people that have been around for a very long time, seen a, a whole load of things. And just, you know, when it comes to the systematic change, involve them in that process and at least consult with them because it's, it's not just the superficial things, you know, I don't know how you found it, but, uh, but I've kind of found that there's some people that are just looking at the, um, the recent incidents, you know, with the Black Lives Matter and what's happened with George Floyd, you know, the Harry and Meghan interview, what's happened there. But these are just not one-off pieces. They're like, it's a buildup of all these different things that have happened over the years that has kind of got it to this point. I don't know, how do you, how do you see it, Jeff? So, uh, I mean, I, I've come to it from a multitude of different angles, obviously you can't avoid the the media and how that has kind of thrust the issue into um, into the forefront. But for me, I'm a I'm a major student of leadership, and I think you really can't lead a team unless you are able to um, communicate with 
every different type of person and empathize and understand the experiences that they've gone through and create environments of safety, create environments of trust, create environments of care. And I don't think that you can do that if you're only willing to look through your own eyes. So I've tried to do a lot of um, research, education, learning on my own, primarily through reading and you know watching a lot of people who are subject matter experts. Um, so that's been primarily how my education uh, on the subject of DEI has come along. Um, I work, uh, I have a client of mine who is um, a DEI, uh, she's an anti-racist uh, strategic consultant. Uh, and I, I learn a tremendous amount from her. I'm a part of a number of different nonprofits and um, the board uh, for them. And we've done a lot of DEI training and seen different sides of it. And actually, it, it's one of the things I wanted to bring up that I thought is really interesting about your perspective here that I, um, I want you to talk a little bit about. You've addressed both sort of the systemic side of these things, that these are systemic issues that are out there. They're things that are happening. You've, been, you've seen it for many, many years now, even though you're only 21. And that you also, <laughs> you also talk... Uh, at great lengths and, and have been very um, specific in using word around individualism and individuals and dealing with people as individuals. And I think oftentimes when people hear, um, hear people talking about addressing people as individuals, it sounds as if you're saying, talk to them as individuals, but not as part of a particular group maybe, uh, like that has an identity or a culture. And then on the other side, if you say systemic, then, then it sounds like you're overlooking the individual. The way you talk about it seems like a really healthy blend. And um, I was hoping you could kind of clarify your particular approach or methodology around this work, because it sounds like you're actually nicely blending together both to allow people to both be individuals while at the same time appreciating that they're part of a system. Absolutely. And I think that, that just to kind of give you um, a flavor of where I'm going to take this, so if you look at training, for example, in an organization, apart, we won't get into the fact that that's always the area that's cut. We won't, that's not the conversation for today. Yeah. Okay? Um, we won't get into the fact that uh, human resources has no resources. That's a different conversation again. But what we will get into today is the training piece. Now, what tends to generally, generally happen is that if I function in a particular way, I assume that you function like me. Mm -hmm. And I assume that another person functions like me. So I will present like how I would want it be, to be presented to me. Now, if, for example, you have a special educational need and I present the way, it's not going to work for you. So, and I think that we need to get away from this generalization, this, this humility, which is around feeling like everybody's the same. And so treat everybody the same. Because actually, this is about the fact that if I'm doing this, this training piece, I might like to do it online, but you might want to do one-to-one. -one. Another person might want to do it in a group scenario because we have different types of learners without getting deep into it because I'm trying to keep this light for you, Jeff. <laughs> no, I like deep. I like deep. That's my thing. But kinesthetic, audio and visual learning, there's different types of learners. And so you can't bring um, a theory-based learner that likes to learn with paper into you know, a kinesthetic environment. You have really got to think about the different types of learning and how people do that in relation to the behavior to, to unlock the change. So it's the different ways of how that comes together. Am I? Here's no, I love it. I, and I want to go even deeper. So let's talk about this. You, you're not brought in by like an entry level employee in a company. You're brought in by higher ups in companies. They bring you in to solve big cultural problems and put out fires. How do you get them to see, because what you're talking about is not a scalable solution in the same way that like, you know, creating, creating an average size uh, car seat is, is a scalable solution because you only need to make one, right? But you're saying some people like to learn kinesthetically, some people like audio, some people visual. Now we have to create the same training three different ways. But, so the, but the thing about it is, is yes, you do have to create it in different ways because you have to make it accessible. But I can guarantee you that when you do it that way, you're going to get the results tenfold, twentyfold. It might take a little bit more time because the principle from my approach is, I, I love the 80-20 rule. I don't know if we, I mentioned that in my last conversation, but the 80-20 rule, I love it because the 80 for me 
in this scenario is 80% of effort and time into your staff. Gone are the days where you can sit in the office and have piles of paper and think that you're not going to see anybody. You're trying to shuffle out the back door because you don't want to be stopped by Jeff along the corridor. You, you know, th those days are gone. 80% of your time is out there with the staff. And that's how you need to do that. And so the things that are important to them are the things that you can't really cancel. I never used to cancel appraisals. I never used to cancel supervisions or one-to-one or -one time. It would leave them absolutely heartbroken. So I would deliver things that I know. And I think that you need to look at the return in terms of that. Yes, there are some things that, that are going to be harder than others, but look at the return on it. And um, it's always going to be it's always going to be better because if I take the assumption that I'm going to create all of this online and you're not an online learner, Jeff, then where does that leave me and as employer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it. I, I see what you're saying about why and the, the logic of it makes perfect sense to me. I'd imagine you've gotten pushback on it before. There's no way that somebody is just going to take your word for it every time. You're very convincing. You're very persuasive. But what I'm saying is like, you know, in my experience of dealing with CEO types, um, there's obviously the thinking of what am I spending? What am I getting for it? And some of these things are more difficult to quantify and they're less tangible. DEI efforts are, are a classic example. There's all this data out there that shows that by having a more diverse workforce, a more equitable and inclusive workforce, it those companies are more profitable. They're more innovative. Like there's all of this data, but there's still a reluctance to it. And in this, and now when we get into the training, and you're talking about any all these sorts of methods, now you're talking about potentially investing much more money into creating, you know, a more accessible training. How do you how do you convince the person whose mind is closed to the idea that there's an investment there? Okay, first of all, I'm going to say to you that because we are on your podcast i have just kind of stripped it back 10 layers there's there's probably you know a few layers before you even get to that because there could be other more generic ways that you can help and and do the training piece yeah and yeah. there's lots of things you have to take on board who needs to do what why do they need to do it are they playing to their strengths maybe you need to move over there and move them away from the c and um, the uh job description there. It's more team based. So somebody in the team would might, might be best off knowing this particular system. I, you know, and, and you know, anybody that knows me knows I'm always going to try and bring a netball story in here somewhere. Okay. So unfortunately, netball, seven aside, uh, we play it a lot in the UK for those of you in the US that don't know what that is. But basically, I had a seven aside team and I had a young person who was 18 she was a rugby player and um, very strategic mind and she was she was you know in university studying studying hard she you know she had all these different things that she was doing now when I she was a valuable member on that netball team and I'll tell you why because she because her brain was just so active all the time she was really good with the statistics so she could do the evaluation very very quickly I'm not saying that others couldn't but because of what the piece that she was doing on a daily basis, yeah, she was able to translate that very quickly. And all I'm saying is when I'm talking about the individualized piece, it doesn't necessarily have to be person on person. It could be who's the best person in that team and mm -hmm. what is the strength of that individual in that team. And it may not necessarily be everybody. So there's quite a few layers before it gets to that point. Now, I'm not necessarily in a position where I have to convince um you know, these, these people, because normally they come to me. I don't necessarily go to them. However, mm -hmm. I will let you into a little secret because there are four pieces of work that I do. I do the crisis navigation. I um, help startups, especially coaches and consultancies, get going in this area. I also help C-suite to get into their roles, as well as the DEI, which I've taken out, which we've already discussed. So what tends to happen is, is that because I'm very good at getting the C-suite into those roles, I get them into those roles and then they take me with them. Makes sense. Relationships, they see the value of your work and they think, wow, this could really be valuable for our team. And when they take me with them because they're in the role, it's like, well, actually, I've got my consultant that I work with. I've been working with her for X amount of time. It's somebody that I trust. We know what needs to be done. 
So make some way. We're coming through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so so working with the CEOs, let's talk a little bit about that. And like that, so working with leaders is something that I will be endlessly fascinated by and uh, study for the rest of my life. Um, and and we can go down the whole route of everybody has a leadership capacity because everybody has a role that they're going to be a leader. And you gave that the example of the 18 year old uh, netball girl, really good with statistics. She was the leader on your team when it came to statistics. Absolutely. So, you know what I mean? So everybody has a leadership role. But when we when we kind of talk about it in a more traditional sense, leadership roles, leadership titles, and then the active leadership the work that you're doing with them, whether it be dealing with crises or working out a culture, that's not a that's not a project. That's not a, a single campaign with definitive start and end. There's actually ongoing work that you have to uh, coach and help these leaders through. Can you talk a little bit about what are some of the things that you try to teach these leaders about keeping their culture from catching back on fire? Okay. Now, that is a very loaded question, Jeff. And one of the things that you asked me previously, which I didn't actually answer, which I will kind of combine in this answer for you now, is about what is the methodology that I use? Yes. It's a three-pronged methodology. And that methodology is understanding behavior, learnt, innate, taught, habitual behavior. If you understand the behavior and how to recognize it, then you'll know if it can be changed, how it can be changed, it, the length of time it might take. Then you've got the learning piece. Are they a kinesthetic or general visual learner? You know, you've got that learning piece, just identifying how they take on board learning, matching that across with the behavior. And then you've got the environmental piece. So you've got those two bits, get the environment right and look at, is the environment right for them to be able to thrive? And you adjust the three accordingly to make it fit so it could be that the behavior and the learning is right but to make the change happen you have to shift the environment or the other way so that's first of all the thing and some of it is around because yes I think that executive coaching is great and all of that but quite often when I go into organizations there's something that needs to happen soon yeah mm -hmm. and so we don't necessarily have a whole year of an um, executive coaching program to, to do this. And I think that this is where sometimes people's mindsets have to change around, around um, if someone wants to change, they can change because actually someone might want to change, but it, the behavior now is so embedded that they can't change so easily. So the desire might be there but they may not necessarily be able to do it. And if you can imagine, Jeff, if it's something that has been embedded from they were four or five years old, you've got to take them through the process of recognizing that it needs to change. Do you, do you see what I mean? Which can yeah. take a while because they don't know anything else. What they've been brought up with is normal. So when I get a CEO or a leader that actually says, well, you know, I had somebody the other day and said, oh, I've got this piece of paper now. Now that I've got this piece of paper, that will shut them up. And I said, well, will it? Because we don't know. He could have went for a, he could have had a divorce last week. He could have mental health issues. He could have special educational needs. Mm -hmm. You hadn't considered all of these raft of things to get the change going. So... One is about what is the process and can it actually, can that person actually change? But one of the things that I actually do is we always go for, we need to change that behavior. That person needs to change. But sometimes what I do for a quicker result is change the thing and not the behavior. Does that make sense? It does. I'm picturing in my head, I really like your model because I, I kind of picture it as like three dials. Like you're looking at your organization, you have these three dials. And and based on what you just said, I, I would, um, it sounds to me like learn behavior is probably the dominant dial there. Because if you adjust the, the environment and the different learning styles to match that person, they may still have such an ingrained deep behavior that, that may be challenging, but I can also see how, and, and this is, I'm mapping it onto myself now as trying to make it personal for myself, but um, so I have attention issues in general. There are certain ways that I can work really, really effectively and certain ways that 
I'm just, you, you are not going to get the best out of me. Right. And, and it's a dramatic, dramatic difference between the two. And it's very much based on environmental and it's very much about styles of working. Right. So, you know, spreadsheets, depending on the context can make me feel very anxious and uncomfortable in mm-hmm. other contexts. I love them and I can use them very, very effectively. So um, same thing with like calendars or task lists or like how we go about scheduling. Like some people work really well with a schedule that's kind of stacked up one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and they can do 25 minutes of work here, 45 minutes of work here. I cannot, I'm a momentum driven person. So I'm either, I need to be in a thing for a bit, like conversations, or I need to be in work, but I can't bounce back and forth between them. So I'm, I'm imagining that if you're in a leadership role and you're looking at it, your organization and you're saying, man, something's not working. You have these three dials that you can look at. You look at all the people's learned behaviors and the type of people they are and try and find the environment and learning styles that match the most number of people. And if possible, cater to each individual. Is that Yeah, I would kind of like, I would say, change the thing. Don't focus too much on the behavior, change the thing. So Mm -hmm. shall I give you an example? Yeah, examples of real. I was in in an organization once where they had, they was having a difficulty with their management team. And in fact, they had no management team. It was just me and they had a regulatory visit, some compliance checks coming through um, that they needed in order very soon. So I was in there and... um, you know, I went into the staff room to grab a cup of coffee because, you know, when you're in this these kind of roles, you have to go into the staff room and get the coffee from the urn rather than have it delivered to your office. You got to be in the middle of it. And anyway, so there was a, um, a gentleman in the in the staff room and he was saying, oh, I hate this organization. We should burn it down. And I said, you need to stop. You need to not say that. And that's not very, you know, it's not good. No, we need to burn it down. We need to burn the whole building down. He said, and I said, you need to stop. And he continued again. I said, you need to stop. He didn't. And you know, like when you say it the third time and you give them the eye stare, (laughs) and they stare back and it's like, this is the last warning. Anyway, so he didn't. So I left the the, the staff room. I went went back to my office and I sat down. I thought, hmm, how am I going to deal with this? Anyway, the phone rang and it was his manager that had said, Oh, um, he's over here. He's really, really sorry. He wants to know what he can do. He wants to come over to see you. But I said, okay, send him over. So he scuttled over, tail between his legs, and we sat down. Now, he actually thought, oh, my gosh, he's going to get fired. And I did think about escorting him off the premises at that time just for him to call down because I thought, I just don't really need this. But we actually sat down because I thought, let me take a different approach. Because sometimes as a leader, Jeff, do you agree? Mm-hmm. You have to switch it, switch it around when people are expecting one thing. You have to come with something else. Yeah. And um, we had a good conversation. We spoke for an hour. And um, one of the things that I realized was that he was a very, very good influencer. He was influencing the wrong thing, but he was very good at influencing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So people were saying he should go, he should be sacked, etc. I said, no, I decided I was going to mentor him for the next two months, come down every Friday for an hour in my office and I'll mentor you. One of the things that I realized was that I didn't want to change his behavior. So the focus wasn't on the behavior. I didn't have the time. So I changed what he was applying it to. So because he was very anti-rules, I just got him to work on a piece of a piece of training that was going to be delivered around the whole the whole um, organization around rules because he's a good influencer. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you see, so I changed what he was influencing rather than rather than stopping his influence. Yeah, it's I didn't like change that. the behavior. I cha- I just redirected it to something positive because he was good at it. It's my whole thing about superpowers. You can use your superpowers to be a hero or a villain. So there it's you go. kind of idea, right? You can you can have this amazing skill. You're very influential, but what are you influencing people about? And I think uh, another thing that you're you're talking about here when you said you know switching up the styles on them is I think the reason you were able to have a productive conversation with him is because his expectation was that it was going to be a confrontation of some sort, that you were going to be scolding him, reprimanding him, escorting him off premises or whatever. And instead you validated him, listened to him, tried to understand where he was coming from. And that builds the basis of trust. And you can't alter someone's behavior if they don't trust you. They're not going to even give you the opening. Absolutely. And, and there's a, a few other things that come into this dynamic. But hey, this is only a short podcast. We could be here all day, Jeff. But the other things which people don't realize is that it was my office. 
So I'm in a place of power. Yeah, yeah. I feel strong in my space. Yeah. So people that come to my office are weary. Do you, do you see what I mean? So, yeah. so depending on the type of conversation that you're going to be having, you have to kind of find that middle ground. If I'm coming into the staff room, that might be the space that he's strong. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So those are the kind of things that I look at and it's all of those things that you have to balance out. And I would, some of the things we're talking about today, especially what you were saying earlier on about all the bits underneath is um, if you look at the shine model, the, the organizational culture, yeah. Um, that explains it really, really well. And um, you know, it talks about the artifacts and the, and the um, yeah, the things that you can see, you got the things that you can see at the top, the things that are very visible, the way that the chairs are, the, 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 how the staff room is positioned, the way people talk to each other. Then you've got the middle bit and the middle, the middle part is around the values and the beliefs and the, you know, how people should be behaving. This is our mission. This is our passion. And then you've got the lower level, which is, this is what's really going on. Yeah. Yeah. So have a look at the shine model. It's a really yeah, good. I'm going to check that out. I'd never heard of that before, but I I'm always thinking about like, you know, the 10 or 15 different unseen elements in any situation. Like I like to think of it as like seeing the matrix. Like when you think about all of the unspoken things that are happening in the environment, and I think your example of like the, the environment that you choose to have a conversation actually is a, is a massive thing. If you want to have a conversation where someone doesn't feel defensive, one of the best places you can do that is in a neutral location. If you want them to feel empowered in a conversation, you can have it in their office, right? Like there's so many decisions absolutely, that go into it. Absolutely. And, and maybe I'm analyzing it too much. I mean, my husband always says, I only ask you a question, Tony. It is not a criminal investigation. You know, he says to me, but these are the things that, you know, because I, I mean, I know that it's out, we're taking it out of the workplace environment. I was speaking to somebody that has said to me that she's moved in with her partner's moved in with her just recently. And it was like, you know, I don't know about the balance. And I said, well, these are the things you need to consider. It's your space. It's your house. You've always been strong in there. Do you, do you see what I mean? And it's like yeah. someone's coming in and now you've got to change the way that you're doing but you've always done it this way so those are the things that will throw them out and it might seem as if you're not making them feel welcome but actually it's because it's your space and you're strong and you've embedded that learned behavior so what i suggest you do is sell your house and go off and buy a house <laughs> for the two of you. amazing so i'm i'm down with all of that it's funny i think you and i get along partly because i think we're both thinking about all of those different factors and, and hopefully not bringing it into every conversation with people or, you know, it might go on too long. I want to make sure we get a little bit of time and just a, a, I think a point that uh, we can wrap up on is uh, the, the fairy dust. Talk to me a little bit about when you brought up fairy dust at the very beginning, what does that mean? You, 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 you have a very magical persona about the way that you even approach things. I, I got that from even the first time that we talked that you are, you are uniquely you, which is something that as someone who is uniquely himself, I really appreciate. And using terms like I bring a little bit of fairy dust to conversations. I appreciate that. Talk to me more about what that means to you and, and why it's valuable to bring it into situations. Well, do you know, the thing about it is, it just happened one day where, um, you know, somebody was down and I said, oh, I'm sending you some fairy dust, you know, and they appreciated it so much. And I met somebody, I met somebody, this is this was through LinkedIn, for example, and I met somebody in person, this before the COVID, and she introduced me as, this is Tony. She does this thing about fairy dust and she's like fairy dust personified. And I was like, oh, oh, this is really interesting. And, you know, it's that whole thing about if your colleagues were going to talk about you at the end of the corridor, what would they be saying? It was that kind of thing. Oh, is this how people are seeing me? I've got a fairy dust reputation to be, you know, following yeah. out on now. So, and it was kind of like, and how I would say, I'll give you some fairy dust. And it was almost this feeling, you know, like Cinderella was going to the ball and then in a puff, you know, uh, she, you know, all her scraggy clothes were changed and she had all the ball gown and everything. And it's almost this thing that it's like, you know, it's, it's instantaneous. So there you go, Jeff, I've just thrown you some, some fairy dust and you're supposed to catch it and suddenly just <laughs> something magical is going to happen. You're going to smile or, 
I don't know. But the, the fact is, is it's is that sometimes in business we still have to have some fun. Yeah. And you know, I know that people learn an awful lot if they're enjoying learning. That is a, is a fact that I know. Absolutely. And it's just something that has followed me. And people have asked me for it from Australia to USA to Canada. They ask me for it. Sometimes I give it to them. Sometimes they ask for the potent stuff. Sometimes I say that I'm just stocking up. <laughs> I'm out of stock at the moment. And um, i done a post one time and, um, you know, when all the, all the, the COVID was going on, and I, because I hadn't posted for a little while, and then I just thought, let me, I'm just going to put a post out. So I saw all this, people were getting a bit nervous, and I'm one of these people that if there's something going wrong, I'm a good person to have on side. And I thought, calm down, everybody. It's, you know, let's think about this rationally, what we need to do. It was that kind of thing. I couldn't bear it anymore, all this panicking. And somebody said, um, uh-oh, here we go. Operation Fairy Dust is back in full swing. <laughs> so I just thought, and I don't know, it just stuck. But it stuck for years, but even more so. And so it's it's that whole thing. And so you've got the fairy dust piece, which is fun. And I think sometimes we like to just return to our childlike state and just have these imaginary, you know, things that are glittery and just make everything feel all right and look all right, even if it's in the moment. And so it's just something that's a part of me now. So Tony's fairy dust. And um, I'm just bringing some fairy dust to you today. And did you I catch what it. I just threw you? Did you I catch them. I, I got it. It took a little bit of time for the connection. We're, we're a decent distance away, but I got it. Good. Okay. Um, I, I love that for so many reasons. It, um, it really is in line with a lot of things that I've learned over the last several years about being able to create sort of instantaneous mindset shifts. Um, there's, a, there's a book by a, a guy named, uh, I think his, it's Todd Henry that wrote the book, The Alter Ego Effect. So it's this idea of like assigning a name, a nickname to a certain set of your own characteristics and then embodying that instantaneously. A lot of star athletes do things like this. Um, so there's that. I read the book, uh, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins, which you count back five, four, three, two, one, and you do whatever the thing is that you were thinking about. And it's all of this sort of like, uh, neuro hacking of creating instantaneous mindset shifts. One of the ones that I do a lot is um, I feel that people often have um, it's as if they're waiting for permission to do the thing. So I just give people permission all the time. I'm like, I, I absolve you of whatever your guilt and worry is and you have permission. Go, go start the business, go do the thing. And I feel like fairy dust is a very, very similar concept of here's my, my esoteric idea of how to get you to shift your mindset instantaneously. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I love it. I think it's a really great way to bring out the best in people and, and shift their mindset. And you wrap that right up in a nice little package in your superhero capacity. And I thought that was absolutely great because anywhere that I've been, I like to leave an impact. I like to add value. You need to know that Tony's been here. So it's almost as if this, you might not see it, but you're going to feel it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, I do. And, and I, if I had to guess, I would say that our listeners right now know that Tony has been here. So oh. now tell them where they can go and they can learn more about you. If they want more Tony, where should they go? How should they connect with you? How should they learn about you and seek you out as those who currently seek you out do? Well, there's the serious side of me and then there's the fairy dust side. And I felt that it was very nice to just have something light and a bit connectable, which is more me and, and away from the heaviness. Um, and I've got my website. Do you want me to give my website here now? Yeah, I'm going to put it all in the show notes for anybody that wants. So you don't have to, if you're driving or you're, uh, you know, in routes, in route somewhere, you don't have to write this down. It will be in the show notes. But if you're listening, uh, Tony, tell them where they can. Where it's they can uh, www.1stlifegroup.com. So that's first life group with the digit one stlifegroup.com. And uh, if you want some fairy dust, then it's tonymcclellan.com. So that's uh, tonymcclellan.com is the fun fairy dust, shoes, lipstick, all of that going on. Let's just live life, feel empowered and um, bring out the diva S in you if you're a diva, that is. And if you're not, then if you're not, then you're still welcome. You can be one. Awesome. We have superhero divas. I mean, I am definitely a little bit of a diva for <laughs> sure. Like there's no question. <laughs> Hey, yeah, you, you, you ain't going to miss me when I'm somewhere. 
Well, I, I encourage everybody to go and check out both your sites, the serious and the playful side. Go get some fairy dust first, then go get to business or vice versa. Either way, I think it's a smart thing on your decision. I think it was a good idea of you to tune into this episode because if I could describe it in one word, one word only, I guess I would describe this show as shareable. Wait, don't leave. If you've never listened to my fancy outro, do it just once for me, please. Okay, if you enjoy shareable, and you find it valuable, there's a few ways that you can support the show. One, you can share it on social media, which I strongly encourage. I mean, it's literally the name of the show, Shareable. Two, you can review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're an Overcast user, as many of my listeners are, make sure to click that star button on the episodes that you like. The third way that you can support the show is by blogging about it or discussing it on your own podcast or even by making a YouTube video where you talk about one of the episodes. And then the final way that you can support the show is by supporting it directly on Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. Now, before I let you go, I want to tell you about one other thing. You see, Shareable is just one of many projects that I'm working on at any given time. I've got another podcast called Rogue. I do a live streaming show every week called The Heroic Council. I've got a blog where I release a blog post twice a week. And if you're looking to keep up with all sorts of different content that can help you grow and become a superhero in life, I want you to check out jeffgibber.me. That's where I list all of my current projects and projects that are coming up in the future, including my forthcoming book, The Lovable Leader. It would mean a lot to me if you could go and check out some of the other things I've worked on because I put just as much of my heart into those projects as I do into Shareable. Thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you for being a supporter. And I hope to see you here on the next episode of Shareable.